All right. So this is the last lecture on module four, and we are going to be covering diffusion today. So at the beginning of the previous lecture, I said we're also we're also going to cover diffusion, but we ended up covering just um, you know other concepts like the the steady state and transient behavior. We talked about photoconductors, things like that. So we didn't actually get to diffusion. So today's class is going to focus on this uh, a mechanism how carriers can move. Uh, in the previous module, we talked about drift, which is the movement of carriers under an electric field. And then this module, we talk about diffusion, which is the movement of carriers due to a concentration gradient. So when we look at the carrier life cycle, these are the processes that we have. So we're focusing on this box today. So after a carrier is generated um, by heat, light, what have you, uh, while the carrier exists, it can drift and diffuse. It drifts if there's an electric field. It diffuses if there's a concentration gradient. And uh, you can actually have both of these processes at the same time. I don't know if I mentioned that. That's going to become very important when we start talking about diodes. Drift and diffusion can happen um, you know, simultaneously if you have an electric field and a concentration gradient. And then after some period of time, after some period of uh, uh, the carrier lifetime, which is you know on the order of picoseconds to microseconds, uh, you have a recombination event where the electron or hole disappear, okay? So there really isn't much time for it to drift and diffuse, but this process just happens over and over again. So on average, you, you end up seeing um, average drift, average diffusion, and so on. Okay, so let's get right to it. Um, Quick recap of last time we talked about in class last time we talked about the difference between transient steady state and equilibrium. Um, these are different ways of applying a stimuli and how different ways that the system responds to stimuli. So the stimuli that we are talking about, we started talking about last class was specifically on optical stimuli. Optical stimuli generates um, uh, carriers. So you imagine light creates excess carriers. All right, and then uh, we solved some problems with that. And then we talked about the transient case. This is where you turn on a light source, you generate excess carriers, and then you turn off the light source. Now, what we found out basically is that the, uh, the, these excess carriers start to disappear. Like you see here, they disappear over time. And the excess carrier concentration over time is given by this exponential decay function. And in that exponential decay function, there is this time constant tau, that is the carrier lifetime. If you have a short carrier lifetime, then the decay function will be rapid like this. If you have a large carrier lifetime, it will be more gradual. Uh, we talked about how to derive the carrier lifetime. We did some example problems. And then finally, we talked about photoconductors, which is an application of all this stuff. Um, in a photoconductor, the concept is actually very simple. In a standard um, semiconductor, the conductivity is given by a sigma is equal to Q mu n times n plus mu p times p. And then in the case of a photo detector, a photoconductor, you have extra n. So, so your n becomes n zero plus sigma n. You have extra electrons, you have extra holes that are created. So of course that's gonna increase the conductivity because more carriers you have, the more conductive a material is. So when you shine light on a photoconductor, it becomes more conductive. When you take the light source away, it goes back to the baseline. Okay, now we get into carrier diffusion. So carrier diffusion is a process that's very much like chemical diffusion. So I always like starting off with this video. This is of course like a high school level thing, but always good to sync up on, uh, sync up on concepts, right? What is diffusion? Diffusion is the movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. So if you just take uh, a dish of water, you put a piece of food coloring, a food dye in it, the food dye, the food dye molecules over time, they diffuse outwards. And the key concept here is that they diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. Okay, there's a high concentration right in the middle. And over time, they diffuse outwards towards low concentration. And as diffusion happens, the concentration gradient eventually disappears. Okay, so you can kind of see that the concentration gradient is starting to disappear already. Um, you know, obviously, if you waited an infinitely long period of time, then 
this entire beaker would be the same concentration. Okay, so carrier, uh, carrier diffusion is very much the same thing. And just a few details of this, I wanna point out a few details that may not be obvious just from looking at this video. Right at the beginning, okay, when you put that drop of uh, food dye in there, you see that there's a very steep concentration gradient. What do I mean by concentration gradient? Concentration gradient means that there's a change in concentration over a distance. So high concentration here, low concentration out here. Okay, you see how there's a very sharp change in concentration right at this boundary? To the left of it, there's high concentration. To the right of it, there's low concentration. So the gradient here, the slope of concentration is very steep right at this point here, okay? One of the fundamental concepts of chemical diffusion and also carrier diffusion is that diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient. So at the beginning, when you put this drop of food dye in there, there's a sharp concentration gradient. So diffusion is happening. Um, the, the diffusion flow in the case of chemicals, it, the diffusion flux, I'm sorry. The diffusion flux is very high at the beginning. Okay, notice how it quickly spreads out. Now at this point, you see how, um, uh, at this point you see how the gradients have kind of decreased, meaning like the, uh, it's not as sharp a gradient as it was before. Okay, so when you have a less sharp gradient, then the rate of diffusion decreases. So again, at the beginning, the thing spread out very quickly. And then as time goes, you see the diffusion process slows down because there's less of a concentration gradient. And the reason why you're seeing all sorts of funky, um, funky shapes in here and in here is because there's all, all sorts of um, interesting flow happening in fluids, okay? That kind of stuff doesn't happen in semiconductors the same way, okay? Okay, so I just wanted to use that as a basis to explain some of the basic concepts of carrier diffusion. So carriers like chemical molecules, they migrate from regions of high concentration to low concentration, and that process is called diffusion. And in a semiconductor, the diffusion occurs if there's a gradient of carriers. So let's say, you have um, you have a high concentration, so high electron concentration here, low electron concentration here. Okay, then the electrons are basically going to diffuse from high to low concentration. Same thing happens with holes. The speed of diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient. The sharper the concentration gradient is, the faster the carriers will move. So let me give an example here. So the x-axis here is n of x. So it's the electron concentration um, as a function of the distance x. Oh, that should have been the y-axis. Let me fix that. <laughs> So this is x and this is n of x. Electron concentration as a function of position. So if I have, let's say I have a very sharp gradient like this. So you have super high electron concentration on the left side and super low electron concentration on the other side. This is a, in basically an infinite slope. So there's gonna be almost infinite diffusion current here. In realistic situations, you can't have just a, a completely vertical concentration gradient, okay? It'll actually have some kind of slope associated with it like this, okay? So this slope, the sharper the slope is, the more diffusion current you get. And I'll show you more examples of that as we go, okay? So that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about concentration gradient, concentration gradient is the slope of the concentration curve. And the concentration curve is versus um, the spatial coordinate. So in this case, just X. All right. So how do we create a concentration gradient? Well, we know one way that very convenient way that we've learned in this module is that you can irradiate a sample with light 
and uh, you can locally generate carriers. So we're gonna look at examples of that. So here's a qualitative example of carrier diffusion, all right? So we start off with a pulse of light. This is a classic semiconductor experiment where you shine a column of light right in the middle of the semiconductor. So we'll talk about the details of this experiment later. It's called the Haynes Shockley experiment. But for right now, we're not gonna talk about the details of that. We're just going to try to understand qualitatively what carrier diffusion is. All right, so first step, you shine a column of light in a semiconductor. So what's gonna happen? Based on what we talked about in class last time, what is gonna happen here, qualitatively speaking? EHPs will be um, created. Electron hole pairs will be created just in the region where mm -hmm. we have the light. Thanks, Melvin. So we created a whole bunch of electron hole pairs there. Now in this diagram, you can see that the electrons are the blue circles and the, uh, the holes are the white circles, just for reference, okay? Now what we do is, let's just say we turn the light off. Okay, just for this example, we just turn the light off. What is going to happen in terms of diffusion? What's gonna to happen to those carriers? And what I want you to do here is I want you to think about this. I want you to, for all problems, I want you to think about this diagram. Memorize this and keep this in your head. There's four things the carrier can do. Carriers can be generated, they can drift and diffuse, and then they can recombine. So whenever I give you an example problem, I want you to think about those four processes. Which of those four processes will happen um, and why will they happen? So let's go back to this example. Okay, we shine light on the material. So in our head, we're thinking there's four processes. There's generation, um, drift, diffusion, and recombination. So we know that when we shine light on the material, we are upping the generation rate. So, okay, we can say like, okay, carriers are generated here. Now we turn the light off. What processes are happening at this point? Let's talk about that. Um, they should diffuse outwards and then recombine. Exactly, exactly. Two processes. Clayton, you got both. Awesome. So when we think about each of the processes, the, the thought process we want to go through is what causes... What causes each of the processes? We already, uh, with the generation, for example, we said like, okay, well, light um, causes carrier generation. So that's why we, you know, we rationalize that electron hole pairs are being created. Now, uh, as Clayton put out, there's, there's two processes that happen. Um, there's diffusion. Diffusion happens due to a concentration gradient. We have a concentration gradient here. There's a high concentration of excess, excess carriers here. Okay, just so everyone doesn't get confused. Remember, there's electrons and holes throughout the semiconductor. Throughout this green region, there's electrons and holes. We're not drawing those in here because that's just a baseline amount. That's a baseline amount due to doping. But when we shine light on the material, we create excess electrons and excess holes. That's the title of this module, right? Excess, excess carriers. So we are creating an excess. So there's a higher concentration of electrons and holes here compared to the outer regions. We have a concentration gradient. Therefore, we have diffusion. That's how we rationalize that. In our, the next process we can think about is do we have drift? Uh, we do not have drift. We do not have drift because there's no electric field. There's no voltage source to create an electric field. So, okay. So there's no, uh, there's no drift happening. And as Clayton pointed out again, uh, recombination is happening. What causes recombination? When you have, whenever you have electrons and holes, you have recombination, but when you have excess electrons and excess holes, there's more recombination, okay? Remember the intuition that we have in our brains here, that recombination means an electron and a hole, they find each other. And when they find each other, they annihilate each other, okay? <clears throat> So when we create excess carriers, we are upping the recombination rate. So the two processes that are happening are uh, recombination and diffusion. Now this, uh, this chart here 
is not focused on recombination. It's just showing you the process of diffusion. So let's just focus on that right now. So if we just consider the diffusion process at time equals zero, it looks something like this. So um, this blue line that I'm outlining with my mouse here, there's a very sharp concentration here, very high concentration of electrons just at x equals zero, where we created that column of light. So this is t equals zero. At t equals one, you're gonna see that the electrons and holes, they spread out. So they look something like this, okay? They went from a narrow column of uh, electrons and holes, they're moving outwards, they're diffusing outwards at T1. At T2, even further out. At T3, even further out still, okay? So this is sort of the process of the carriers diffusing outwards over time. I have a uh, just, question yeah. For yeah, go Sorry. ahead, Norm. yeah. Um, so right here at time t equals zero, um, we have electrons and holes, um, and then you know we know that they diffuse to the left and to the right to kind of create a uniform, you know, trying to create a uniform distribution within this material. Yes. Why is it that they just don't immediately recombine since they're really close to each other at time t equals zero? Oh, that's that's a really good question. That's a really good question. And in fact, you're right that when they are close together like this, there is the recombination rate at time equals zero is the highest. I see, I see, okay. Yeah, because they, they are, you're, you're thinking exactly the way you should be thinking. Like, like there's a lot of electrons and holes in close proximity. So yes, they will recombine, um, the recombination rate at the beginning is gonna be the largest. And then as they spread out, there's the probability of recombination goes down because they're more spread out. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. Yeah, just if, if everyone recalls like, uh, the carrier lifetime, we derive the carrier lifetime here. The carrier lifetime is inversely proportional to N and P. So the more electrons and holes you have, the more the, 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 the smaller the carrier lifetime is going to be. All right, good. Okay, so when we have a situation like this, uh, just one detail here that I wanna put here is that these uh, um, initially it looks like a column of light, like a step function, but when diffusion starts to happen like this, you'll see that the profile starts to look more like a bell curve, okay? Um, T1, T2, T3, you can see that these all look like bell curves. Just the width is increasing over time. And so this carrier pulse concentration is actually given by this Gaussian uh, function. If you look at what a standard Gaussian function looks like, it's A times the exponential of x minus x zero squared over two c squared. Okay, so uh, this x sub zero, this is the, um, the center, where the center of the pulse is located. So in this case, the center of the pulse is zero. So this x sub zero is going to be basically zero. Okay, and this two c squared, this, this is related to the width, you know, the standard deviation here. Okay, so the, the larger c is, the wider the, the pulse is. Okay, so this is what a standard Gaussian curve looks like. So you can imagine that if this pulse is becoming shorter and wider over time, then this C is going to change over time. And you can see that uh, this indeed, like that you have this DP times T in the denominator, okay? T is time. So over time, the, the Gaussian curve is going to become wider, okay? There's a T in the denominator here. And um, this, this is the diffusion coefficient. So the larger the diffusion coefficient is, the more likely these things are to diffuse, the, the more quickly the curve will widen out uh, over time. And the way that you can think about the diffusion coefficient is that it's the speed at which carriers diffuse, okay? This is related to the concept of mobility. We'll, we'll talk about what that relationship is uh, uh, later. But right now I want you to think, of, recall when we were talking about mobility, we said that, okay, you put an electric field on across a material and the velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. Mobility times the electric field. So higher mobility means the electrons move faster in response to an electric field. Similarly, uh, this diffusion coefficient tells us how quickly carriers diffuse in response to a concentration gradient. Okay, 
the, the larger the diffusion coefficient, the faster they'll diffuse. Um, P max is, of course, the, the amplitude here. And then X minus uh, X max in this case is zero. And then uh, X is the uh, spatial coordinate here. Okay, so this is a very similar to a Gaussian function. So let's talk now about uh, the equations that are governing uh, carrier diffusion. So we're going, we're peeling back one layer of the onion. Um, in chemistry, there's a rule called Fick's law. And that talks about the, the uh, rate at which molecules diffuse in response to a concentration gradient. It turns out the same rule, the same Fick's law applies to carriers in a semiconductor as well. So if we look at an example here, the diffusion current, Jn diffusion. So what that means is J stands for current density. Okay, just to remind everyone, current density is amps per centimeter squared. Um, to jog your memory here, the way that our mental model of current density is kind of like this, is that um, let's say you have a current going through a wire and that current is I, okay? Um, that I is equal to J times the cross-sectional area. So this is the cross-sectional area here. Okay, so current and current density are related by the cross-sectional area of the material through which the current is flowing. Okay, so think about this. This is current density due to electrons. That's what the N is, due to diffusion. Jn diffusion is current density due to electrons diffusing. This is equal to Q times dn times dn dx. Q is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, the constant. dn is the diffusion coefficient for electrons. I just talked about what that is. And then dn dx is the concentration gradient. So the sharper concentration gradient you have, the more diffusion current you're going to have. The larger your diffusion coefficient is, the, the more diffusion current you're going to have. Okay, so um, again, the constant D is a diffusion coefficient. The units for this is centimeter squared per volt second, centimeter squared per volt second. Uh, and then D depends on a variety of things, including temperature, um, it depends somewhat on doping conditions, but it's largely temperature dependent. If you think about uh, uh, chemical molecules diffusing, it turns out they diffuse faster at higher temperatures, right? So just keep that in mind. Higher temperatures means things are gonna diffuse faster. Okay, so we take examples here, like this is, these are some very simple examples. Let me just get rid of that extra clutter on the slide. So we're looking at two plots here, electron concentration versus X, pole concentration versus X. And the blue lines here represent, we're just giving an example of what a concentration gradient might look like. So X and then N of X. So in this particular example, you have a situation where a hypothetical example where the electron concentration happens to be low on the left side and high on the right side. So in this case, the carrier concentration is increasing in a linear fashion. All right. So in this case, the way that we want to picture this in our head is that electrons are going from high concentration to low concentration. All right. So let's just draw that in there. So an electron is moving from high concentration to low concentration. So it's moving in this direction. Okay, so someone in the class, so just this is a good refresher. If electrons are moving from right to left, which way is the current going? Left to right, the opposite. Left. Correct, that's right. Thank you, Ali. So current moves opposite the movement of the electrons. So the electron diffusion current density, the current due to the electrons diffusing from right to left is shown by this arrow here, Jn diffusion. This is going from left to right, okay? All right, 
Now the holes diffuse independently. Okay, so the holes you can think about, they don't really see the electron concentration. They only see the hole concentration. Okay, so you could have, you know, you could potentially have like different concentration gradients of holes and electrons at the same time. And in fact, this happens in diodes. We'll talk about that more later. But again, we have low concentration here, high concentration here. Right, so holes are going to diffuse from right to left. Now there's one difference here. When holes diffuse from right to left, what direction is the current density? Remember holes have an effective positive charge. So that would be right to left as well? Right to left as well, right. JP diffusion right to left. I know these seem somewhat like obvious questions, but it's, it's just important that we're all in sync on these fundamental concepts, okay. Anything with positive charge, we define current as a movement of positive charge. Okay. All right, so we've kind of established how electron and hole, um, hole diffusion works. There's one concept of flux. Flux is the direction that the electrons or holes are moving. And the flux is always going from high concentration to low concentration. And then the second thing is the diffusion current density. Okay, and that depends on whether it's an electron or a hole. If it's an electron, then it's opposite the flux. And if it's a hole, it's in the same direction as the flux. Okay, And that is the reason why there's a negative sign in the case of the holes, okay? So if, if we look at this example here, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so right here, this is an example of N of X. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the polarity of the slope here? Positive or negative? Positive. Okay, you have a positive polarity. So DN DX in this case is positive. Um, the diffusion coefficient is always positive, and this Q is always positive. So in this case, the JN diffusion is also positive. Okay, so positive, the way we define positive in vectors is that positive is left to right. In this case, you can see, uh, in this case, the DP DX is the same as last time. It's also positive, positive slope. This is positive, this is positive, and then you have this negative sign here. So ultimately JP diffusion ends up being negative. That's why you see JP diffusion pointing from right to left. Okay, so just so you understand all the polarities, I'll just erase the excess ink on this slide and we can move on. So at this Sorry, point in the, knows. yeah, go ahead. Um, no one, why is JP um, diffusion um, negative again? Uh, we can just do this again. Um, this, this slope here, the slope is positive. So mm -hmm. this is a positive term. Mm -hmm. uh, the diffusion coefficient is always positive. The constant Q is positive. But then you have a negative sign here in the formula. Oh, I see. It's just defined as being a negative, but it's canceled out. The negative is canceled out in JN diffusion. So... I see, I see, okay. Well, Understood. in JN diffusion, we don't have that negative sign. That, that's right, why that's these two formulas are different. That, that's exactly why these two formulas are different. And this negative sign is, is sometimes students forget about that. That's why I just want to emphasize. But in JN, we don't have a negative because of the Q is negative. No, 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 no. The Q is a constant. Q is always positive. So this term is positive for the electron. This is positive. This is positive. Whenever we have Q in these equations, this Q is actually talking about the, the constant 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. There's no polarity associated with, uh, with, with, this, with, with Q when we, when we talk about these equations. Oh, I see. I thought that the Q for... Um... Q for electrons was negative 1.6, and then the Q for holes was positive 
I, I see what you're, yeah, I see what you're getting at here. Um, so I thought it was negative times negative. They're just yeah, yeah, function, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was so I think okay. I think you bring up a good point. Is that um, you know in in the formulas given in the the notebook and the convention that I use on my slides is that Q represents just that constant 1.6 times 10 to negative 19. No polarity involved there. And But in physics, in, in some of the physics uh, equations, the Q actually stands for the charge and that could actually be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. I, I see where the confusion is coming from. Okay. So in Thank these you. equations, Q just stands for the constant and pretty much for the, uh, for the purposes of this class, the Q will mean 1.6 times 10 to negative 19, the constant. Thank you. Sure, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. All right, so at this point, um, we can summarize the carrier life cycle. Um, since we've talked in detail last class and this class, we've talked about the details of each process. Now we can show that we have like these equations corresponding to... Um, Sorry, sometimes PowerPoint does this. Uh, we, we basically have corresponding equations for each process. Okay, so generation, uh, we talk about steady state generation with this equation, GI equals RI equals alpha R and I squared. That's the generation rate. Um, the recombination rate, um, GI and RI, like remember they're equal to each other, alpha R times NI squared. And if we're talking about non-steady state, then we have to think about that the carrier concentrations are an exponential function of time. I haven't put that on the slide here. I just put some simple, simpler equations here. Um, with drift and diffusion, things are very well defined. You know, we, we had some equations for the drift current from the last module, Jn is equal to the electric field times sigma n. And just remember that, that sigma n is equal to um, uh, Q times mu N times the electron concentration N. Okay, so if you'd like to add this to your slide, you can do that. Um, sigma P is equal to Q times mu P times P. All right, these are physical relationships, well-defined uh, electric field times uh, the mobility times the electron concentration. Same thing for holes. Okay, so what this means is that these currents are proportional to the electric field, also proportional to mobility, also proportional to the electron or hole concentration. So if you think about it, at when, uh, when the hole and electron concentrations are high, um, even a small electric field is going to create a lot of drift current. On the other, other hand, with diffusion, uh, the JN diffusion and then JP diffusion here, which we just went over on the last slide, these are proportional to the diffusion coefficient and then the concentration gradient, okay? This is proportional to electric field and concentration. This is proportional to the concentration gradient, okay? So depending on the situation, one can be more significant than the other. And there may, may be certain situations where they're actually equal to each other. And at equilibrium, they actually have to be equal to each other. Okay, so we have equations for both of these processes. And then finally, just to remind everyone again, the carrier lifetime is the average time between generation and recombination events. So the time between generation and recombination here. Okay, so a little bit more quantitative now we can be. At this point, we realize, okay, well, there's both of these processes. If we wanna calculate the current, the total current, we can now consider drift and diffusion. Last module, we only considered drift. And now we, have, now we have the information to be able to consider both. So if we combine diffusion and drift, this is, this is all we have to do. We have to say, we say that the current density due to holes, and remember current density is given in amps per centimeter squared. The current density due to electrons. Sorry, did I say holes before I meant electrons? The current due, density due to electrons is the, the, um, the current density due to drift and the current density due to diffusion. So we just figured this out on the last slide. These are 
this is the JN drift, this is JP uh, drift. So we plug in these equations here, and now we have a full equation for the electron current combining the drift component as well as the diffusion component. We do the same thing for holes. So we have the drift component and we have the diffusion co component. I just have this highlighted here again, just don't forget that the diffusion has a negative sign associated with, with it because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Okay, so we have four components, JN drift, JN diffusion, JP drift, JP diffusion. So the total current is the sum of the electron current plus the whole current. And so that means that there's a total of four different components that we have to consider when we try to find the total current in a semiconductor. All right, so you see at this point, we have, we have a full picture of current in a semiconductor right now. Okay, whether you're talking about a basic semiconductor resistor or an advanced MOSFET or a diode, what have you, or a new type of device, these, this relationship, total current is equal to the drift and diffusion components due to electrons and holes. These four components, it, it, it'll work every time, okay? You'll see that certain components might be more significant than others, and you could ignore certain ones, depending on what type of device you have and so on. And uh, different devices have, can work in wildly different ways, but this rule still holds. Okay, so a quick example uh, of the direction of drift and diffusion currents. All right, so uh, suppose we have an electric field and concentration gradients as shown. Uh, so I want everyone to take like, um, say three minutes here and then fill out this table. I'll give you one example just to show what we're talking about here. So what I want you to do here is that you are given an electric field that moves from left to right. And you're also given a concentration gradient. Notice <coughs> that you're at high concentration on the left and then low concentration on the right. And that's true for holes, also true for uh, electrons. So N and P both. So what I'd like you to do here is draw, this is a simple exercise, but I'll just make sure that you're, you know, your mind is thinking the correct way about um, drift and diffusion. So you wanna draw an arrow that indicates the flux, which means the direction that the electrons will hold move. And then you're gonna draw an arrow indicating the direction of the current due to each mechanism. So very similar <laughs> to what we did a couple slides ago. <clears throat> so I'll give you the first example here, electrons drifting, okay? So um, uh, this first one is the flux. We can see that the electric field is moving from left to right. So what we'll do is we'll reason that, okay, um, electrons, when they drift, they go opposite the electric field. When we talked about drift, holes go in the same direction as the electric field, electrons go opposite the electric field. So we're gonna put a left arrow here to show that the electrons are moving opposite the electric field from right to left. In number two here, we're gonna draw an arrow indicating the direction of the current. And what we're gonna reason here is, okay, if electrons are moving from right to left, then the corresponding current has to be in the opposite direction from left to right. So that's it, okay? So what I'd like you to do in the next uh, co a couple minutes here, just uh, fill out, uh, we're gonna fill out the uh, uh, other three entries in each of the two tables. So I'm gonna mute myself, go ahead and uh, do that. <clears throat>
All right. All right, so help me out here. Let's start with <clears throat> uh, electron diffusion. How about that? So what is the direction that the electrons are moving? Is it from left to right? Left to right, great. Thank you, Ali. Yep, and what is the direction of the corresponding current? Um, it will be um, the opposite. Correct, right to left. Good. All right, how about holes? Hole drift. Um, it should be uh, left to right. Left to right, correct. Corresponding current? Um, left to right. Good. And uh, then finally, hole diffusion. Right to left. Whole uh, diffusion will happen. Um, well, actually, so the holes are at a high concentration on the left, <clears throat> lower concentration on the right. Oh, yeah. Um, so left to right. Yeah, that's correct. Yep, yeah, left to right. And then um, the current would be in that same direction. Correct. Great. Awesome. Okay. Good. So we're all on the same page with that. Um, and also, you know, just to, as an example, this kind of goes to show you that you can have some interesting things happening here. Like uh, we set up these uh, gradients and then you have like currents going in different directions. You have three components of current that are going from left to right. And then one component of current that's going from right to left. So, you know, you can have, you have these four components of current that you see in table two and they can go in different directions. So the total net current, <laughs> it really depends on the situation, you know? In certain cases, the, the currents can actually balance each other out and you might actually have currents ha going on, but the net current ends up being zero. So you don't measure anything on your ammeter, but there could still be like individual components happening. They just happen to sum up to zero. So, okay. All right, more um, discussion questions. Uh, suppose these are the types of questions that you might have on like homeworks and quizzes. So let's just talk about a couple of these real quick. Uh, suppose we place an electric field over the length of the semiconductor, which carrier contributes more to drift current, the majority carrier or the minority carriers? So this is a situation where we take a voltage source like this and we connect it to a semiconductor like this. And so, of course, we're going to get our currents flowing through this way. So this is the direction of the total current. But the question is, which carrier, the majority carrier or minority carrier, contributes to more of the drift current? Um, I would think the majority carrier. The majority carrier. Why is that? Um, so if we have more, let's say, uh, let's say if it's uh, in type, um, if we have, you know, more electrons than we have holes, and then you know that I just think that they'll 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 just contribute more to the to the current. Yeah. I mean, I kind of understand it's just kind of hard to put it into words, but maybe yeah, yeah. Just... no, you're you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. Um, so if we take this, if we take this example and, you know, like last time when we did this example with the voltage source over a semiconductor, we said that the electric field here, electric field is equal to the voltage divided by the length of the semiconductor. So the length is right here. Okay. E is equal to V over L. And so the electric field is going to be the same everywhere in the semiconductor. Now let's go back. Let's go back to this, this uh, slide and remind ourselves about what drift currents are. J sub n is equal to the electric field, which we just found, V over L, multiplied by sigma n. So this is E times Q times mu n times n. And the JP is equal to E times Q times mu P times P. So in both cases, the electric fields are the same. The uh, Q is the constant, so that's the same. 
the mobilities are, you know, they, um, they'll be different for sure. But like, let's say the n, um, the mu n is typically larger than mu sub p. Um, but in an, if you have an n type semiconductor, let's say, then n is going to be much larger than this term p here. So when you, we're mainly looking at the differences between n and p. In an n-type semiconductor, n is a majority carrier and it's many orders of magnitude larger than p. In a p-type semiconductor, p is many orders of magnitude larger than n. So depending on what the majority carrier is, the majority carrier will contribute more to, um, you know, jn and jp will be much larger than the, than the other one, depending on uh, which one is the majority carrier. Okay, so the answer in this case is the majority carrier is going to contribute more of the current. All right, next, um, suppose we created a gradient of carriers by irradiating the sample. Which carrier contributes more to diffusion current? Now, this is an interesting question. Um, I would think the minority carrier. This is, this is, a, this is a tricky question, actually. <laughs> So let's say we are irradiating a column of light in a semiconductor like we did before. So we're creating electrons and holes here in the middle. We create a gradient of carriers by irradiating, irradiating the sample. So there's high concentration in the middle here and then low concentration on the outer regions. Uh, so which carrier contributes more to diffusion current? So let's look at our equations here. The diffusion current is um, Q times dn times dn dx. So it's, uh, if we compare the two, these two are the same, Q and Q are the same. dn and dp assume that, you know, these will change by a factor of maybe two or three in silicon, not more than that. So there is a difference for sure. dn is typically larger than dp in silicon. Uh, but I think the main thing we need to look at is these, these two, dn dx and dp dx. So, and the interesting thing in this problem, if you look at this, which, which one do you think is larger, dn dx or dp dx? Are we looking at a uh, doped semiconductor or intrinsic? Uh, let's say we're looking at an intrinsic semiconductor. Oh, I see, okay. Um, for intrinsic, I would think that they would be the same. Yep, that's right. If you have, um, if let's put this down, intrinsic, So uh, dn dx may be similar to dp dx. How about in an extrinsic case? So if it's doped with, if it's doped with, let's say, um, p type, then your um, gradient is going to be smaller, dp dx will be smaller than dn dx, given that the baseline level, I guess, of dp of the holes is um, higher than the baseline level of electrons. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You have to look at what the baseline level is, right? The minority carrier, um, the minority carrier is going to have a lower baseline level Minority carrier is going to have a lower baseline level. So the dp dx is going to end up being greater than dn dx. Okay, so I think that's pretty, that's kind of an interesting uh, result there. Okay, so which carrier contributes more to the diffusion current? Uh, the D in, in the case of a p-type, the dp dx is greater than uh, the 
uh, I'm sorry, did I get that right? The gradient would be uh, dn and dx. Let's see yes, the way around. The other way sorry around. about that. Yeah, dn dx is larger in the case of a p-type semiconductor. So um, the minority carrier is actually going to end up having more diffusion current, which I think is kind of interesting. All right. Okay. So last thing here, we talked about uh, what drift current looks like in an energy band diagram. How do you think diffusion might be represented in an energy band diagram? Um, any thoughts on that? Would that just be just, I guess, almost casual recombination? You know, where um, the no, electrons not, not just quite. drop right back down. Uh, nope, no, no, because that, that's you're talking about the recombination process. So, so the question here is asking about diffusion. What might diffusion look like in an energy band diagram? So, I'll I'll draw this out for you. So, let's say this is EC. EV here, All right? So let's say we have like two semiconductors and one is highly doped n-type and then one is, let's say it's intrinsic. Okay, now this isn't a complete picture but I just wanna throw this out to get you thinking about this right now. That's the whole point of this last question just to get you thinking about it a little bit. When we get to diodes, we will actually um, uh, talk more about a phenomena that we call band bending. So in the case, let's say this is a highly doped n types, um, highly doped n type, and this is an intrinsic material. So here, the Fermi level is close to the conduction band, indicating that it's a highly doped n-type. And on this right side here, the Fermi level is down here. Okay. So the way that we can kind of think about it is there's going to be a lot of electrons here in the conduction band. And on the right side, there's going to be very few electrons in the conduction band because the Fermi level is much lower. So these electrons are going to diffuse over um, to the right side, moving from region from high concentration to lower concentration. And we're gonna see later that, that there's these Fermi levels actually are actually gonna equalize. So we'll get to that later. I don't, I don't wanna introduce that right now because it'll it may create more confusion. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about what the actual diffusion constants are for common materials. You can see for uh, germanium here, For germanium, it's, uh, it's 100, uh, 150, um, 3,900, and 1,900. So these are typical values. <clears throat> Silicon is the one we're going to be working with the most. Mu N and mu P, these are the values that are being given for low doped semiconductors. Low, you know, like doping on the order of 10 to the uh, 10 or 10 to the 11, something like that. They are close to the intrinsic um, carrier concentration. So mu N and mu P 1350 and, and 480 here, uh, DNDP is given here. Okay. So the reason I'm putting this slide out is first of all, I want you to notice a pattern. Electrons have high mobility. They also have a higher diffusion coefficient. Okay. There's like a, like maybe close to three X difference between these. There happens to be close to a three X difference between these as well. We'll see why in just a second. Um, but I also want you to compare the different materials because as engineers, we have to choose what material is most appropriate for our application. So if we have a situation where we need high electro, we need the electrons to move very fast through the material. Basically, we need a fast semiconductor. We'll use something like gallium arsenide because the electron mobilities are much, much higher than what you get with silicon, even higher than what you get with germanium. If you need a situation where both electron and hole mobilities are both fairly large, then you might want to go with something like germanium. Okay, and when the mobilities are large, the diffusion coefficients are correspondingly large. 
Okay, next thing is the Einstein relation. The Einstein relation, it's an important equation. Uh, it relates d and mu. So you remember how I was saying that it, the, the ratio of d to mu seems to be constant in, in this table here. Okay, mu n and mu p, if there's a three and a half x difference, or three, three x difference, and then here there's also the same ratio. Okay, it turns out d and mu are related to each other. So if you know the mobility, you can calculate the diffusion coefficient. If you calculate the diffusion coefficient, you can calculate the mobility. Okay, so that's the relationship between the two is extremely simple. It's, it's kind of like the De Broglie's equation, deceptively simple. Um, and it can be derived fairly reasonably easily too. Um, D over mu equals KT over Q. This kind of rhymes, so this, it's easy to remember in my head. So the ratio D over mu is equal to KT over Q. Now, um, just as a note, KT over Q, if you remember before, whenever we had this constant KT, one of the rules of thumb, we reminded ourselves that, that KT is equal to 0 0.026 electron volts at room temperature. Okay, and KT, the unit's electron volts is a unit of energy. When we have KT over Q, KT over Q is, um, is energy divided by, um, divided by charge, which turns out to be voltage. So this also, um, if, you do, if you calculate Boltzmann constant in 300 and 1.6 and 10 negative 19 here, you'll find out that this is equal to 0 0.026 volts at 300K. So just remember that because that's very useful for calculations. A lot of calculations I give you will be at room temperature. Okay, 0 0.026 electron volts is KT and KT over Q is 0 0.026 volts or 26 millivolts. Okay, <clears throat> so the Einstein relationship can be, um, the relation can be derived from the drift diffusion relationship that we showed here. So the total uh, uh, hole current, so the way we do this, the total hole current is equal to the drift component here plus the, uh, um, diffusion component here. So this is the drift component. And then this is the diffusion component. Okay, and you set these equal to zero. So you start by assuming that you're at steady state and that the net current is zero. Okay, so from here, if you solve for, you notice that you have um, dp and up in this equation. Okay, if you relate the electric field to the concentration gradient uh, P, and you don't need to know the proof of this, then you can basically derive this equation here. Now, how do you relate E of, e, e of X to the concentration gradient? That's something that we're not gonna go into just now, but hopefully you'll get a little bit more of an understanding of that when we talk about uh, diodes. Okay, it's a very simple equation. It tells us that the ratio of D to mu is temperature dependent. So at high temperatures, the diffusion coefficient is gonna be much larger than mu. And at low temperatures, the diffusion coefficient will actually, could actually get low, uh, lower compared to mu. Okay. Even though the Einstein relationship is derived assuming that the net current is zero, this actually holds in some non-equilibrium situations as well. So you don't need to know how it's derived, just know how to use it. The way that we use it is if you know D, you can calculate mu. If you know mu, you can calculate D. Most of the time you will know mu because I'll be given to you, or you can look it up in the table of mobilities like you did on the first exam. And then you can calculate D from that. All right, continuity equation. This is where we bring in, uh, we kind of like bring together a lot of the uh, concepts here, okay? This is the last thing we'll cover in this module. And it's an important one because the continuity equation is kind of like Newton's laws of gravity or mass conservation, uh, you know, some very basic fundamental relationships in physics. This is kind of like the electrical analogy of those things, okay? So uh, the way that I like to describe it to, to students, um, is, uh, um, is this bucket of water, 
is this bucket of water analogy, okay? The bucket of water analogy is a statement of a conservation of mass. And then in electronics, the continuity equation here is going to be the conservation of charge. Okay, the reason I do it this way, like, like I said, I like to kind of build up concepts from the ground up. Um, but also like the, the concept of, I feel like these types of mechanical or like, you know, th these types of mass type analogies are easier to uh, digest and understand compared to electronics. I want you to see the analogy here, basically. All right, um, so let's talk about this thing first. So here's, a, here's what we're talking about. Uh, we have a bucket of water, okay? And in that bucket of water, we have some, we have a pipe that's going in. So it's dumping water into the bucket at a certain rate. And that rate is given in liters per second. So let's say, um, I don't know, let's say like uh, 10 liters per second are coming into the bucket. Okay, so let's just say, for example, this is equal to 10 liters per second. Uh, there's also a pipe taking water out of the bucket. Let's say that this is seven liters per second. Okay, now just using common sense, what's gonna happen here? You're flowing water into a bucket at a rate of 10 liters per second and the rate of you're flowing water out of the bucket at a rate of seven liters per second. What's gonna happen over time? The bucket's gonna overflow. The bucket's gonna overflow, right. So the, it, it, it turns out when, when you're dealing with electronics, your charge, your charge can't like overflow like this, okay? You have to have more of like a, you can think about, well, Charge can change over time. I shouldn't put it that way. Let, let, let's not get into that. Yet. Let, let's just, okay, <laughs> back, back up for a second and just let's just focus on the water analogy right now. So as Corey said, if the rate in is greater than the rate out, well, then, then you're going to end up, uh, the, the water level in the bucket is going to increase over time and eventually it's going to overflow. But if we want to be more specific about it and put that in the form of a differential equation, we can say that the rate of increase of water in the bucket is equal to the rate in minus the rate out. Okay, just ignore the last two terms for a second. This is contributing water into the bucket. So this is a positive term and the rate out is taking water out of the bucket. So it's a negative term. That's why it's rate in minus rate out. Okay, so if in this case, if you have a rate in of 10, rate out of seven, then um, the dW dt is going to be three liters per second. So the, the water is gonna increase in the bucket at a rate of three liters per second. Okay, now um, just for kicks, you know, we throw in some extra processes that add or remove water from the bucket at a certain rate. Uh, imagine that the, the um, you know, that the water is an open, the bucket is in open air like it's a pool, let's say, where you have some rate of evaporation and then you also have some rate of condensation. Evaporation removes water from the bucket, so that's why it has a negative sign associated with it. And condensation adds water to the bucket. And so it adds, um, that's why it has a plus sign associated with it. Even when you put these two additional processes in there, you, you still have this, a similar differential equation, just two extra terms dw dt is the rate of change in the water in the bucket. If this term is positive, that means the water level is increasing. If dw dt is negative, that means the water level is decreasing. What's going to happen at steady state? What happens at steady state? There's no accumulation. Yeah, there's no accumulation and then there's no reduction either. So this dW dt goes to zero. Okay, that's a special, that's a special case that we can consider. Okay, so we're, we're basically gonna do this uh, continuity equation here. Uh, with the electronics, we have something called the conservation of charge instead of the con conservation of mass. So you wanna think about, um, let's say just a charge. Okay, you can think about it as a positive or negative charge, it doesn't matter. The point is charge is conserved. 
So what, the way we want to think about it here is that you have a block of material, there's charge going in and there's charge going out of that material. Okay, and the way you want to think about it is remember like charge going into the material, kind of like water flowing into this bucket of water. This is current. Okay, a current is given in amps, which is coulombs per second. And remember current density is the, um, so the I is given in amps and that's uh, coulombs per second. And then current density is just the current divided by the cross-sectional area here. Okay, so current is given in coulombs per second. Current density is current divided by the cross-sectional area. So the way I want you to think about this is that current is basically dumping charge at a rate of so many coulombs per second into this gray box, this gray volume. And there's also a current leaving, and that is the charge out. That is also a current. Okay, that is removing charge from that gray volume. Okay, so that's the rate in, the rate out analogy here. Rate in is the charge in, and then rate out is the charge out. And then, you know, you have these additional processes here, evaporation and condensation. The analogy in the electronics is recombination and generation. So recombination is the annihilation of carriers that's gonna remove charge from that uh, gray box. And then generation is going to create additional charge in that gray box. Okay, so we have four processes here. We have like a rate of, um, you know, we, we have in the case of water, we had dW dt, and then here we have dP dt, which is given in coulombs per second. Now, if, we've, if we plug in these different uh, values, the, the different um, components of this equation here, uh, we get, so we have to, we have to do this thing where it says one over Q JP of X minus JP of X plus uh, Delta X divided by Delta X. So where did this come from? Okay, first of all, this, um, this one over Q term is, uh, um, is present in both of the, uh, both of the parts here. Um, this is to uh, basically convert the current uh, to like a, a flux, okay? And then here, this is, this is the thing I, I, I would like you to understand. The current going in is JP of X, okay? X is right here. It's the left side of the gray volume. So the current at right at this point X is the current going into the volume. And at X plus Delta X, this is the other side of the volume. This is the, uh, the right side of the volume. There's a current JP of X plus Delta X. So that is the, the rate of charge going out. JP of X is the rate of charge going in, JP of X plus Delta X is the charge going out. So that's where these two come from, the difference between the two. And then this, um, uh, this Delta X here is the distance between these two. Okay, um, the rate of recombination is Sigma P divided by Tau P. Um, sigma P is the excess hole concentration divided by the carrier lifetime. So this is another form of uh, the recombination rate. Okay, we haven't gone over this before, but this is something that you can note down to yourself. This is an important equation. So carrier um, excess hole concentration divided by the carrier lifetime, that will give you the recombination rate. And the generation rate, we are kind of assuming for the time being that it doesn't, there's no generation in there. So where does the equation kind of come from? Um, or how can we use this to derive the continuity equation? This is what we're gonna do in this next slide here. Um, so we're gonna solve this continuity equation assuming only diffusion and recombination. Okay. Uh, meaning like we're just kind of kind of ignore the, um, the generation thing right here. So we're gonna assume no generation. And the reason why we put it in this funny form here, okay, you might wonder why did we do it that way? Uh, by putting it in this form with the delta x at the bottom, uh, we can take the limit as delta x goes to zero. This is the definition of a derivative. So what we're doing here is we're conceptually saying that this box, the width of this box, we're gonna make that narrower and narrower and narrower and we're gonna take the limit as that delta x goes to zero. Okay, when we do that, 
When we do that, something interesting happens. Uh, this term uh, basically becomes a, uh, a derivative. JP of X minus JP of X plus Delta X over Delta X. This becomes a derivative of JP of X. Okay, so DJP DX. Okay, so this whole term just collapsed down to just a, a single derivative. Now we plug in the formula for the diffusion current JP. This is Fick's law. So we talked about the definition of diffusion current multiple times now. So remember that negative sign here. So we're gonna plug in, um, we're gonna use this current JP. So this is the equation for JP. And um, if we take the derivative of this, if we take the derivative of, of JP, this is saying take the derivative of JP with respect to X. So the derivative of this equation just becomes the second derivative of this term. Okay, um, you know, you can watch the video again, just remind yourself why this is. This is just, this is a constant, this is a constant. This is a function of sigma P of X. So you're taking the derivative of a derivative that gives you the second derivative. That's where you get the second derivative here. Okay, so D sigma P uh, DT is equal to D sub T times this term here. And um, that Q term, that uh, this Q term cancels with the one over Q here. And so you're just left with this and the uh, 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 recombination term here. Okay, so this uh, derivative or this uh, uh, small derivation that we did is for holes, but the same thing will apply for electrons as well. Okay. All right, so now we have our continuity equation. What did we do? We basically said, hey, you know what? We need to balance, we need to have conservation of charge, just like we did conservation of mass in the bucket of water. And we came up with this relationship here. And then we had this trick where we converted this part into a derivative. And that's ultimately how we got here. A nice um, uh, differential equation, um, one for holes and one for electrons. So notice that in this differential equation, we have a term that's with respect to time and we have a term that's with respect to space. So this would be considered a partial differential equation with the time dependence as well. <clears throat> the Schrodinger equation was like this too. We had, we had a spatial dependence and we had a time dependence. And uh, one of the things we did with the Schrodinger equation is said, hey, you know what, let's consider some special cases where we can simplify this general equation. And the thing that we can do, um, we did the same thing with the Schrodinger equation. So we said like, hey, like let's consider steady state. Steady state means all the time derivatives go to zero. All right, in the real world, that means that we are applying a stimulus that is fixed in time. If we do that, then the carrier concentrations will not change with time. We went over that in class last time. Uh, what the definition of steady state is. So these dp, uh, d sigma p dt, d, d sigma n dt terms will all go to zero. All right, when we do that, we are left with this equation here. Okay, what I'm circling here. Okay, basically this term and this term disappear. So you're left with this and this left in the equation. All right, that's what's being shown here. <clears throat> now, um, we can define this second term. We can define sigma p over dp tau p. We're defining this uh, uh, denominator here as lp squared, okay? So this is not an equality, remember. This is a definition. We are defining dp times tau p as something called lp squared. So lp by definition is the square root of dp times tau p. And same thing for ln. Why do we do that? Why did we arbitrarily just define the square root of dp at tau p is equal to lp? It turns out that this actually has a physical meaning. That's why we do that, okay? Um, and this is the uh, something called the diffusion length. It's called the average distance a carrier travels before it recombines, okay? Relate this to the carrier lifetime. The carrier lifetime was the average time a carrier exists before it recombines. And the diffusion length 
is the average distance a carrier travels before it recombines. Okay. So this has a physical meaning and there's gonna be problems in your homework where you're gonna calculate the diffusion length. In order for this to make sense, I want you to see a specific example of this. So this is the continuity equation in action. We're gonna be using it here. So suppose carriers are injected at X is less than or equal to zero. What is the distribution of carriers at X greater than zero? And what is the diffusion current? All right, so in this case, what we're doing, we are shining light on the left side of the semiconductor. So we're creating our excess electrons and holes there. <clears throat> and this is going to be steady state injection. So these, um, we're gonna generate some excess electrons and holes on the left side. And on the right side, we're not shining light. So we don't have the excess electrons and holes. So that's how we set up our gradient. There's a higher electron and hole concentration on this side, lower on this side. So this is called carrier injection. We're injecting carriers by shining light on the material. We're not injecting them with the syringe, we're just injecting them by shining light on the material. So we already know on the left side, we, we know that the excess carrier concentration is given by these equations. We did this in two classes ago, or no, last class, steady state carrier generation. And we also know that these are going to diffuse. So we think about the four carrier processes. We think about, okay, generation, drift, diffusion, and recombination. On the left side, we have a lot of generation happening because we're shining light on the material. Then we think that, oh, okay, well, is there an electric field? No, there's no electric field, so there's no drift happening. But is there a concentration gradient? Yes. So there's gonna be some diffusion happening. And, oh, is there some recombination happening as well? Indeed there is, because we're generating all these excess carriers on this side. There's gonna be recombination as these excess carriers go over to this side. Okay, so there's gonna be recombination here. There's also gonna be recombination here as the excess electrons and holes diffuse over, they're also going to recombine after some point in time. Remember, an electron and hole only exists for a small fraction of a second before it recombines. So this is gonna to start to diffuse, but then it's going to recombine before it gets you know, all the way down this way. <clears throat> so if we, if we look at this example, start with the steady state continuity equation at x is greater than zero. This is the equation that we start off with. It's that differential equation, second derivative with respect to x. We are solving the differential equation to find the carrier concentration profile. And it turns out, again, this is not a class in differential equations. So I'm not gonna tell you how to solve this, but if you've taken a class in differential equations, you'll know that when you have these types of things where the, the, um, the derivative or second or third derivative of something is equal to some constant, then the solution is an exponential. Um, and it turns out that in this particular case, the um, sigma P of X, which is what we're solving for, the carrier concentration with respect to position, <clears throat> this is equal to delta P e to the negative X over LP. Okay, this was a differential equation with respect to X. And then uh, the solution to the differential equation is P of X. All right, we solve it and notice what happens here, e to the negative x divided by LP. This is that diffusion uh, length term. I'll tell you what that means in a second. Okay, so from here, we calculate the carrier, uh, calculate the current from the carrier concentration profile. So the first step that we wanted to do is just find, you know, figure out the uh, carrier concentration with respect to x. And we can see that this is an exponential function. What does that mean? is that you're gonna have an exponential decay in the carrier concentration over time. Once we figure out the carrier concentration profile, then we can figure out the diffusion currents. Okay, we do that using Fick's law. JP of X, here's Fick's law here, we've seen it before. Q times DP times the gradient of the carrier concentration. Okay, so we have to take the derivative of this exponential and the derivative of an exponential is an exponential. So you could just do this in your head or do this in, in, you know, do this at home to prove to yourself that if you take the derivative of this function, you will end up getting another exponential function like this. And whatever's in the exponential term comes out here. That's how you get the DP over LP here. 
Okay, so now we've kind of figured out, we have a more of an understanding of this problem here. We know that there's diffusion. We know that there's a concentration profile. So we figured out the concentration profile here. We've also figured out the diffusion current here. All right, now let's try to get a physical understanding of what's happening. So this is the carrier concentration profile. This is your uh, sigma P of X here. This should be a sigma here. This is going to be, I'm sorry, this is P of X, not sigma P of X. It looks something like this, okay? It's an inverse exponential function. And uh, the P of X is equal to P zero plus the sigma P. This is the excess carriers, excess hole concentration. This is the excess hole concentration. And this is the initial hole concentration that's there um, on the right side, you know, the, that's not dependent on light. So on the right side, at, at positive values of X, you have, the X um, you have a high hole concentration here because these holes are diffusing over from the right side, but then they upper, end up recombining. So that's why over the farther away you go, the hole concentration returns back to P0. This is P0 over here, okay? So out here, the whole concentration is just P0. This is due to the doping of the semiconductor material. It has nothing to do with this light source here or the excess carriers. But at the interface here, close to the boundary, you'll see that you'll get this gradient in whole concentration that decays exponentially, okay? And that's what this negative X over LP term is. This, now I can tell you what the physical interpretation of LP or LN is, okay? Um, this is our delta P, by the way. This is the, um, the delta P is what we calculated on the previous slide. It's the whole concentration uh, on the lighted side, okay? So what I want you to think about in your heads is that you're generating holes on the left side. The holes are diffusing from high to low concentration going to the right side, but then they're also recombining after a certain point in time. So they diffuse over and then they recombine. That's what the concentration profile looks like this. You have a high carrier concentration on the left. They start diffusing over. Um, that's why the carrier concentration decreases here. By the time you get out here, everything's already recombined. So you don't have any excess carriers out here. That's why this goes down to P0, it decays down. Okay, so the diffusion length is the average distance the hole diffuses before it recombines. It's the average distance. You know, like the reason why we say average is because some holes are gonna diffuse quite far. Some holes will diffuse, it's, some holes will diffuse quite far before they recombine. And some holes may not diffuse that far before they recombine. They might recombine right away. Recombination is a statistical process, you know? So some holes re recombine fast, some, some holes recombine slower. So correspondingly, you have some holes make it really far before they recombine. Other holes, they don't make it very far at all before they recombine. That's why you have this exponential decay here. The rate of decay is given by this L sub P term here, the diffusion length. If you have a large diffusion length, then you have a gradual decay. So there'll be a gradual slope here. And if you have a small diffusion length, you have a sharp decay that looks like this. All right. So you'll have an example problem like this in your homework. And the last concept I want to cover, I apologize a little bit going over time today. I should be done in about four or five minutes here. I just want to explain to you the Haynes-Shockley experiment. This is an important experiment that combines the concepts of diffusion <clears throat> and uh, drift and, if I, and uh, recombination. <laughs> it actually includes a lot of different things. And it turns out this is a very important experiment in semiconductors because it allows you to measure the mobility of a semiconductor and the diffusion coefficient simultaneously, simultaneously in a semiconductor. So this is a very valuable experiment. Uh, the reason it's called Haynes-Shockley, obviously, because um, you know Shockley was one of the people involved in this experiment, so was Haynes. Uh, Shockley is, uh, was credited with the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor, he and his team. And these are one of the experiments that they did <clears throat> to characterize and get important experimental data on semiconductors. So here's how the experiment goes. Okay, the first part here is 
we have a bar of semiconductor. We put a voltage over it, okay? Okay, so now we have a voltage. So we have to consider drift current and diffusion current, both. <clears throat> now, the next thing we do is we put a mask over the semiconductor. What is a mask? It just means that we're covering up uh, some parts of the semiconductor and we're just leaving a small slit opening here. Okay, so we shine light down on the semiconductor and light will only go through where the mask is, is not present. So the light just comes through here and we create that column of electron hole pairs, just like I showed you in the example earlier. So we're locally creating just a narrow strip of electron hole pairs um, in this portion. By the way, this is n-type uh, silicon here. This has a length L. All right, so I just want you to think about this for a second. Uh, what processes are happening? We go through the four processes in our head. Is generation happening? Yes, it's happening. We had a flash of light. We generated excess electron hole pairs here. Uh, less generation happening here because there's no light. Is drift happening? Yes, drift is happening because we have an electric field. There's a voltage source here. So the electric field is going to point from left to right. So the electric field is going to go this way. Do we have diffusion? Yes, we have diffusion because, interestingly, there's a concentration gradient. There's a high concentration of electron hole pairs here. And there's a lower concentration to the left and right. So we have diffusion also we have to think about. And we also have recombination. Recombination is always happening, but recombination is enhanced by the fact that you have excess electron as a holes. Remember, the higher the concentration is, the more uh, recombination is going to happen. So we have to consider all four of these processes. But it turns out that the fact that we have all four of these processes, it tells us a lot about the semiconductor. All right, so um, should be done here fairly soon. Okay, so what happens here, if you think about this in your head, is that these, this, uh, you create a flash of light, you create all these excess carriers just in this region. Now, what's gonna happen is that um, uh, by putting a voltage source here, these carriers are going to travel down this way. Okay, the holes are gonna travel from left to right, same direction as the electric field. The electrons are gonna travel in the opposite direction, okay? Um, so the electrons actually get, they, uh, they go out of the semiconductor fairly quickly. So there's just an initial blip that you see that, that we're just gonna ignore for now. The main thing we're concerned with is that the holes that we created are traveling through a length of semiconductor like this, okay? At the beginning, the pulse looks like this at T0. You have a sharp pulse like this, okay? This is showing the whole concentration versus X. X is the horizontal position here. At the beginning, you have a sharp peak like this, okay? And these carriers, as they're moving through the semiconductor like this, as the holes are moving through the semiconductor, this sharp peak actually spreads out in time spreads out in time. You can see that at T1, you can see that this, this Gaussian profile here, which we looked at earlier, is now shorter and wider. Okay, so the carriers are spreading out, the holes are spreading out as they move from left to right through the semiconductor. So this pulse, you can imagine this pulse moving in from left to right, as it's moving, it's becoming shorter and wider. By the time it gets to the other end of the semiconductor, by the time it gets to x, to x equals L, what's gonna happen is that the, this, this, um, this pulse will have widened out more, obviously. But the interesting thing we do here is that there's an ammeter that measures the current. So as these holes, as these excess holes are exiting the silicon material, they go through the ammeter and they're detected. So you end up detecting a pulse of current. And that pulse of current is actually going to have this Gaussian shape, which is quite interesting, right? With that Gaussian shape, remember that Gaussian 
shape has a lot of information about the semiconductor because the width of the Gaussian, um, this width of this Gaussian peak, the width here is equal to this um, delta, uh, the square root of four times dp times the time. Okay, we're not deriving how we got that here, but it, you can see that it comes from this, um, this equation here, all right? So um, basically the width of this is gonna tell us the, dif the diffusion coefficient. So we have a way of figuring out the diffusion co coefficient of the semiconductor. The time, the speed at which this pulse moves has to do with mobility, the electric field. So carriers are moving in response to the electric field and the velocity is equal to mobility times the electric field. We're putting in a known electric field. So if we know at how long it takes, if we can measure how long it takes for these carriers to get to the other side, we'll know what our delta T is so that we can measure the velocity. And from the velocity, we can back out the mobility mu. Okay, so in a single experiment, by looking at, by creating a pulse of carriers, um, the time that it takes for this pulse to get from one side to the other, that tells us the mobility. And then how spread out the pulse becomes over during that time, how spread out it becomes, how wide it becomes, tells us the diffusion coefficient. So really cool, um, really cool experiment. All right. Um, okay, so I ended up going 15 minutes over. The last slide here, just um, uh, another table of um, room temperature properties of the three common semiconductors, just so you can see the mobilities and diffusion coefficients, even things like effective mass, dielectric constants, a lot of information um, at this table here. Just in the interest of time, I'll just, um, you know, you have this on your slides as a reference. So to summarize uh, today's lecture, so we found out in this module four that carriers can be created by doping. You can create, uh, doping will create carriers, essentially one type, N type or P type. You can also create carriers by increasing the temperature that generates electron hole pairs. And in this module, we focused on optical excitation, which generates electron hole pairs through light. <clears throat> so this can very rapidly create electron hole pairs. You can selectively create electron hole pairs in certain regions and not others. This is a very convenient way to generate carriers. Uh, next module, we'll talk about electronic injection. <clears throat> All right. We talked about the four carrier processes, generation, drift, diffusion, and recombination. And the continuity equation brings all four of these processes together in a relationship that is a statement of charge conservation. Okay, that charge can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay, and we looked at that there's a, a general form of the continuity equation, there's a steady state form of the continuity equation. And we looked at some examples of the steady state form of the continuity equation. But the continuity equation is a really important one. It's used to analyze any type of device, any type of semiconductor, because it's just a statement of uh, conservation of charge. So if in your careers, if you end up, you know, designing the next generation of transistors that might work with nanotubes or, um, uh, you know, like single, single electron transistors or a lot of these 2D materials that are under research right now, knowing the basic fundamentals of the continuity equation, which we've learned here and in the last module, knowing band, um, band gap structures and the continuity equation, this will prepare you to, to um, understand devices that we don't cover in this class. In this device, in this class, we only cover diodes and MOSFETs primarily. If you understand these basic concepts, you'll be ready to tackle the next generation of devices um, <clears throat> in your career. Uh, thank you for staying um, extra today. I know we went over time, but I just want to finish up this module today. Uh, if you weren't able to stay, obviously, you, know, you can watch the lectures. Um, any questions before we um, end the lecture today? Um, quick question. So when is uh, the quiz for this module going to be due? Uh, the quiz for this module, um, it'll probably be due, um, you know, maybe a week and a half uh, a week and a half to two weeks from today. I can be flexible on that day. I just want to make sure that we're, we, we're able to do that before the uh, next test, right before Thanksgiving. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for your attention. Remember the homework is posted um, uh, on Canvas. Uh, please, um, you know, get going on that. You should be able to do the problem from module four here. Uh, there are some problems that are involved in terms of calculations. Is there some graphing that you can do to understand the concepts better? So 
um, spend time on that. And of course, you have your project outlines um, coming up. So, uh, you know, if you find yourself getting overwhelmed or you need, you know, need time, like if we want to work on some of the moving some of the deadlines, we can do that. Okay. Uh, good luck. Uh, I'll be available if you have questions. Um, email me and uh, I'll see you on Monday. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.